before we um, actually, um, and then of course I'll be using high resolution picture and different images and so on. You will just be so kind to forgive me if there is a bit of delay in the passage between one media and the other, because of course these are all, most of them are online resources and there's a, a lot of bandwidth being used. First of all, I'd like to start with the video and we can even hear the sound of the uh, of the fountain the drone would be driving by this was shot in april which was a very uh, difficult time especially for italy and then later on for everybody because of the pandemic but as you might know it in in europe in the, in the west basically outside of china italy was the worst affected country right at the beginning right after china um, and then, and then uh, Italy entered lockdown pretty early, beginning of March. So it was really shocking that uh, spring, March, April are usually extremely busy time of the year. And this should have been, this place it should have been, it should have been completely packed. Instead, dead empty. You could see this was shot, I believe, at the beginning of April by a group of. Um, um, uh, of filmmakers called the Dirty Seagulls. You, you might love their videos on YouTube. Follow them on YouTube. They're really, really great. And, and this drone fly, fly by. It's amazing. We can actually see how the structure it's impacting in the city center. How how big it is. How overscale it is compared to everything else. So the Pantheon was built in Roman times, and very little has changed since it was built. Um, it has been, there's been only very few modification to it. I'll, I like to, I'm sorry, this is Pets I want to like to, to um, play it again because it's so beautiful. And it was built at the time of Emperor Augustus in the first century before Christ. Around 27 BC. Now, uh, as you can see, it has the shape of a big round dome with a pronos. Kind of a porch in the front but the pantheon that we are looking at in this video it's basically uh, the result of a reconstruction that took place probably around 120 130 around 132 a.d under emperor hadrian so the pantheon was actually somehow rebuilt now let's see uh, and place it using basically museum no 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 this is google maps okay google Google sometimes. Okay, so this is Google Maps. I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with it. And basically, we have the center of Rome. I might enable the 3D later on. Let me take the labels off. Okay, so you can see the River Tiber, River of Rome, the Vatican here on the left. Maybe if we put the 3D, it would be easier and the city center of Rome. Now, all, most of ancient Rome, it's here on the right, the Colosseum, the Forum. The Pantheon is right in the middle, halfway between the Colosseum and the Vatican. And you could see, as we zoom in, is not a couple of blocks away from Piazza Navona that you might recognize here on the left because it's got this long, peculiar shape. This is because it was built on uh, um, an area that was originally was occupied by a Roman stadium. And then, of course, when the stadium was abandoned, they turned the piazza, the the uh, the stairs of the of the stadium into into a, into buildings, and the 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 center of this of the stadium into a piazza. So the Pantheon stands here. You could see from above. If you go on a two D, it's right perfectly circular with a hole at the top. We'll be talking about this hole later on, and it's quite a big building compared to everything else that surrounds it. And it was meant to be like that even when it was built. Now this area of ancient Rome, and I'll be uh, using some uh, maps and some um, other uh, imaging. It's basically an area which was quite um, peripheral at that time. The city center, as I said, was the, this is not opening now. The city center was basically um, the, let me just use this, was basically the, um, the area of the Roman Forum, the, the hills, the area between the capital and hill, so to speak, and the, um, and the river was mostly occupied by the um, fields of Mars. It was a marshy area that later on was dried up. So this is a model 
that you can find in a museum in Rome, in the Palazzo della Civiltà Romana. It's a model that it took um, an archaeologist, Italy Gismondi, who actually built this uh, some 20 years. And uh, it's a, one of the most accurate reproduction of ancient Rome. Uh, it's a real model. It's, it's like uh, 30 feet wide, something like that. It's, it's really, 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 really big. And um, on the left, you may see the Pantheon is right here and the Piazza Navona area today and the River Tiber. So the forum, all the center was here. But at the time of Emperor Augustus, the city expanded. Um, this is actually Claudius, but um, the city expanded quite far out the original uh, area to include another region. And here we have the fields of Mars, how they look like in the, how they look like now, but how they uh, have some, uh, very important buildings, including the uh, Piazza Augusto Imperatore here, the tomb of Emperor uh, Augustus. Now, to compare, it's here on the, on the, it's a big building, which is by the river here. This is the mausoleum of Augustus. Next to it today, there is the so-called Arapaches, which was originally built a bit halfway along what was Via del Corso, the so-called Via Lata, and the Pantheon, where all together um, a kind of a, a project to celebrate the beginning of the empire and especially the race to power of Emperor Augustus. Now, Augustus was the emperor who actually reformed the Roman, founded the Roman empire by transforming the old Republic and the dictatorship, which was basically uh, the way Julius Caesar uh, led the Roman, um, the Roman Republic into uh, uh, an empire. So the, the government of only one, one man. And as a reflection of that, he ordered to build the Pantheon. The Pantheon, as we would be able to see now, um, I'm gonna drop with the, uh, the street view so we can see a nice, This is in the evening, but we could see it's basically with the light of dusk. So this is the facade of the of the Pantheon with the eight columns and the uh, the 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 um, and the facade here full of holes. They, there was there would have been uh, bas relief originally in Roman times. Now um, the uh, facade bears the name of. M. Agrippa L.F., which is Marco Agrippa. It was the emperor's son-in-law and best friend and was also the head of the army for, for a time, was also governor, was one of the consulates of Rome, so one of the local governors. And that's what it says here on the description. Tertium Fecit. He was the third time he was in office as a consul uh, of the city. And basically he was the one in charge of building of, this, of the Pantheon. Now, what does Pantheon means it means the um the temple for um to all the gods so in fact if we let me just open this up again if this um let me just if we have um, um i'll show you like some plans and some and some drawings the Original Pantheon probably was slightly different than this one. It was probably rebuilt at the time of Adrian, as I said. The um, word Pantheon means to all the gods. And to give you an idea of how the Pantheon would have looked like at the time of, of, um, of uh, the Roman emperors, I'll show you a, a short video where we'll be able to enter from the door. The door is the same door as we can see today. In fact, the door of the Pantheons, doors of the Pantheons are one of the few original bronze, door, bronze doors that survived since the Roman times till nowadays. Each one of the doors weighs some seven tons, 7.5 tons, and they're still working with the original system, although it's been repaired about 20 years ago. Let's see and get inside. You can see that most of the structure is pretty unchanged. The flooring, 80% of the marble floors, they are still the original one dating back to the second century AD when the Pantheon, as I said, was rebuilt. The dome, the structure is still there. Probably there were some metal decorations added to it. And the hole on the top of the roof 
uh, was still, you know, was there part of the original design with no glass, no carbon, so it's wide open. We'll talk about that later. The shrines that you could see, they are pretty much the same as today. Now, for comparison with this video, if we go on to the um, Google Earth, let me see if Google lets us, I have, go here it says I'll, I'll, the pantheon is closed of course as most of the monument the museum now they're closed in Rome as part of the so we are inside the pantheon and you can see that there are some difference on the altars they're like statue of saints but this part here of the um attic the 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 top part of the decoration is pretty much still you know, the, 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 it looks like the original one. It's been rebuilt around 1930s to show how the original one was, while the attic has been refurbished in the 1700s. Now, if we keep going on our video, you can see that it was a very unusual temple because it was round and big and had the chance probably to host the ceremonies inside, while traditionally in the pagan temples, the uh, services, the sacrifices, the function were outdoors. Only the priests and the ones uh, in charge of the services were allowed to enter temples. To enter a temple uh, in the cellar of the temple where the image of the gods, where the presence of the gods were, was uh, in Roman times was a big, considered a big sin, a big sacrilege, which was punished. Um, there is, um, let's call it a novel, but was actually a, a, um, um, a tale about uh, um, uh, two men entering the temple and starting a number of adventure uh, called the Satyricon, written by Petronio Arbitro. So if you want to get a bit uh, into that kind of uh, time, it's, it's quite a, a nice reading. It's, um, it's a Roman, um, uh, it's, it's a Roman uh, book and it, it has a lot of things that it might be good only for adults, uh, if you know what I mean. Anyway, the um, this is a part of the of the of the reconstruction of the model of the digital model today. Uh, back to the uh, construction of the of the pantheon. Let me just um, get another. Okay, uh, as I said, Emperor Augustus, or, or uh, through through Agrippa, and here we see Agrippa. This is his portrait. Um, was 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 built in the first century, around 27 BC. This is because we know that that's that was the year where where um, Agrippa was in office. Then, about 100 years later, there was a fire that damaged it, and so it was eventually. Uh, if not completely restored, if not completely rebuilt, uh, for sh surely highly uh, restored by this emperor, Emperor Hadrian. You might be familiar with him because it was the emperor that led the empire to the maximum expansion and decided that that was enough. The Roman Empire could not control anything beyond the borders, and ordered to build the vallum, the wall in, in the in between England and Scotland, in the northern part of England. So. Um, amongst other things. He also traveled a lot and he probably wanted to rebuild the, the Pantheon. He didn't want his name on the facade of the temple. In fact, he ordered to uh, write the name of the original um, of the original uh, builder, Agrippa, as we saw in the, in the picture below. And then what happened? Well, the Pantheon was used uh, for a good 200 years or more until in the, um, uh, presumably around 390, 400 AD, it was, uh, sorry, it was uh, again um, transformed into a church. Not straight away, it was first shut and then tur turned into a church by the um, uh, 609 AD. Now, um, it was this Pope here, Pope Bonifacius, who basically um, ordered to um, transform the church into, um, into uh, to, sorry, transform the Pantheon into a church, which was donated uh, to the church, and ordered to bury um, hundreds of bones of martyrs from the catacombs into the Pantheon under the main altar of the Pantheon. So, the Pantheon became a church then, and it's been a church ever since. Now, 
in the Roman times, it will look like something like this. Probably not with the eagle on the facade, but maybe with the more complex bas relief. In fact, all those holes that can be seen on the facade, they are basically the result of the fact that the nails were actually holding down the uh, metal nails were holding the, the bas relief onto the wall of the facade and then later on were stripped off. Also the letters that you see, M Agrippa and so on, all of those were stripped off, were only redisplayed using the grooves uh, as a, to find the shape uh, in, the, in, the, in the early 20th century. So even those that are not original. But most of the Pantheon, as I said, is original. There were probably statues also in the large niche, niches of the facade. If we go back uh, on the, on the, uh, let me see. Yes, let's see this one here. Uh, we'll be able to see the facade again, and there is basically. I oh, know we ended up inside. Let's let's say inside it with this one. There are basically the niches. Let me just get. They're basically the niches. Probably they they are empty today, but this is the picture of one of the niches, and you can see that it's completely empty. There would have been a statue here. Well, now there is a door, a very important door. I will speak about later on. Now structurally you will see that the Pantheon basically can hold inside a perfect sphere. In fact, the width is exactly the same as the height, 43.2 meters. Uh, some, uh, basically some uh, 130, uh, some 130 uh, feet. Um, and um, the masterpiece of engineering is, was the result of the Romans being able you see 43 centimeters, 40, 43 meters. And there is a, a perfect sphere, which has a very interesting, a very interesting uh, function. Now, as you could see from this, there is a perfect proportion between the pronos, the pit the, with the 16 pillars at the entrance and the part inside, and also the volume. The dome starts exactly halfway through the sphere in, inside, and the walls are some six meters thick at the bottom, some 18 feet thick at the bottom, and they end up being only just uh, uh, under uh, four feet at the top, about a meter thickness on the top. The materials inside the dome are lighter and lighter. So from concrete with bricks, we have then halfway tufa, and then on the very top, we have um, we have uh, pumice inside the concrete. Pumice is a very light volcanic stone that is used like for a, a scrub today. This is still, okay, you can still find in, the, in some, um, those shops that sell like natural remedies and, and soaps and stuff. It's used like a natural scrub. It's like a hard sponge and it's extremely light. So it even floats on water. So it was used as a mixer of, of cement or concrete. We still today, we don't know exactly how they calculated the weight that prevented it to collapse. In fact, starting from Brunelleschi and also Bramante and all the other great architects of the Renaissance, they tried to crack the secrets of the Pantheon by seeing how did they make the dome? Because they wanted to do the same dome, for example, for the Basilica of St. Peter or for the um, Basilica the Santa Maria, Santa Maria, um, uh, del Fiore, the, the Duomo of Florence. So you could see that every single element has a very precise proportion. From the, from the inside, the dome, let's go back one picture, the dome starts like halfway through basically, but from the outside, you can only see two thirds of the, of the, uh, of the, of the outside. It's basically this cylinder covers the, the, the beginning of the dome. And this is because at the bottom, the dome will tend to open up uh, horizontally. And so these parts here on the side, they're there to keep in place the pressure of the dome and send it straight down to the foundation. Underneath the floor, there's a huge foundation made of concrete. So there's like a giant ring of concrete underneath the pantheon to support all that weight. To this day, how they calculated all the forces, the weights, without any algebra, without any uh, complex calculation is still a mystery nowadays. The engineers, the architect, they don't really know how the Pantheon was uh, built uh, with no uh, possibility to calculate the weights and the 
in, uh, in all the uh, technical aspects. Now, in this image, you could see the concrete at the bottom. The soil is not rock, it's a marshy area. So it was also very difficult soil to build. And then this is an artist's impression. Um, we not really, we don't really know um, what type of, um, of, of, of molding they use, if they use a scaffolding like this or a different shape. This is really something un unsolved still. There are different theories, but there's not a definite word. This was a huge problem also for the artists in the Renaissance because they wanted to be able to build a dome without having to build a full round scaffold with the, you know, all the hundreds of hours of work to set it up and to have the workers and the materials and all that. Um, to a point that in the Middle Ages, Ages, there was this legend that the Pantheon was built, the first, the first built the drum, so the walls around, and then they filled that with dirt, and they put some coins in this dirt, and then they built the dome using the support of the dirt, and then after they finished, they told the Romans, oh, the gold coins in there, if you want, want to get it, get a bucket of, of dirt, and then maybe it might be your lucky day, and then dump the dirt somewhere else, and so that's how they, they got for free this job. Of course, these are like old stories made up later on, probably by some early tour guides that were not, you know, didn't have enough information about that. It um, the 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 other by middle middle age legends because of course the the uh, the pantheon um, was was probably built with scaffoldings. The Romans had cranes and other mechanisms. And you can see the different colors in the walls correspond to a different material materials lighter and lighter as you go on the top. And that's why the very top, the whole of the top, is wide open. And yes. If you're thinking on a bad day, on a rainy day, it does rain in, and I'll explain later on how all this works. Now, the uh, and so there's no glass. The hole at the top, it's nine meters wide, which is about uh, just uh, just over uh, 27 feet, 30 feet wide. So it's pretty pretty big, and it rains a lot. You can see the detail of the different materials different consistency uh, of the material inside. And then again, the cross section. As you can see that there are also passages and corridors inside the Pantheon. In fact, although most of those windows are fake, there are a couple that leads to uh, some rooms that are hidden inside the Pantheon. They are absolutely not open to the general public. I worked there for about eight years. Even I haven't been there very, very much. I will be showing you later some of these rooms that host a small private museum Yes, there is a small museum with statues and paintings and other art objects inside the walls of the Pantheon, which is only open once a year, but not to general public, only to the members of a society, the Academia dei Virtuosi del Pantheon. I will explain this later. And uh, I worked there, as I said, nearly a decade. I've only been in there twice. <laughs> so it's really, really difficult to get it to get to get in, but hopefully they'll open to the public again. As you could see, during the mid Middle Ages, the Pantheon was kind of in a sort of a abandoned uh, time. There was even bell tower built on a, on the top, which later on was replaced with the two ones built by Lorenzo Bernini. And of course, the level of the soil grew up. So the bottom of the building actually was, was buried under few um, few yards of dirt, few meters of dirt. This is because being very close to the river and being quite low uh, as an area compared to the river, of course, every flood, every time it rained a little bit too much, the uh, old dirt that was, was well, the deposit that were taken there, basically with this, we can keep this one for later. I don't know why is this not showing the... Um, so the, basically every time there was a flood, the city was entirely flooded and all the dirt was left there. And then the level of the city rose by a few meters. Um, in the city center of Rome, it varies from like a, a minimum of like six, seven feet up to sometimes 15, 20 feet gap between the level of ancient Rome's first, second century and the, le the street level nowadays. Uh, early this year, they did some archaeological excavation next by the Pantheon and they did found some ruins ruins that the archaeologists were already aware of because there were excavations made in 1990s uh, so it's we know what's what's down there already but of course um, the magazines and newspaper they made a big news out of it and you might have seen the picture um so this again the pantheon this all these images of ancient pantheon of uh, the first century room they're they're artist impression we don't really know the exact details uh, we have a, an, an idea by comparison. We don't know exactly what was in there. Um, we assume there were statues that were removed and replaced, but 
um, there is a, uh, we can speculate that the Pantheon must have host probably the statue of the main deities, in fact, has seven main altars, seven main niches, and then eight smaller ones. So probably each one of them was dedicated to a different god. The concept of Pantheon mean, means also the most sacred place, so the, the house of all the gods, in which not just one single deity was venerated, but the entire system of the Roman religion. And this was connected with the, with the importance of the emperor and the importance of the sun. Uh, by the first century, the Romans started to identify the emperor as a god and to identify him with the sun, of course, the most important planet that gives sun light and gives, of course, uh, life to everything in the universe. So as the sun makes possible life and is the, you know, makes our, our uh, days bright, so the emperor you know, was the guarantor of the brightness and of the future of the Roman Empire. You might notice in this picture that the columns are two different colors, which is true. The, they are gray granite, the ones on the facade. They are 12.5 meters tall each. Each one of, of, of them was shipped from Egypt, from a quarry in Egypt, and uh, they weighed an average between 60 and 70 tons each one of them. So when always they ask me, oh, how did they carry them all the way from Egypt to Rome? Well, very carefully. I mean, no, they uh, were loaded into a large ship and filled with beans that was used like to absorb every shape of crack and then uh, docked to the harbor of Rome. And from there on smaller, uh, some of floating platforms that were basically pulled along the river Tiber and then from the river to the Pantheon is only a few hundred yards. So that will last part on logs and, and pulleys. That wasn't very difficult because it's very small. We have to consider that the Romans also use cows as pulling mostly and, and bulls as pulling animals. And also the Romans vastly employed slaves for basic laborers and also as home servants and builders. Although the most skilled builders, so bricklayers, people working marble and all the other technical jobs, they were usually paid workers. So it was not just slaves. So slaves were a part of the Roman workforce, but not the only workforce as somebody might think. Referring to what I said about the sun, the Pantheon is also a solar instrument. And now before I explain this, I have a, a video that was made this year by the ministry, Italian Ministry of Culture that it's also available on YouTube, if I can play it. This video can uh, explain us the connection. It doesn't explain, it illustrates a little bit the connection between the the sun and the pantheon. There you go. Sorry, sorry, I don't know why this is flicking now, but it shouldn't be flicking like that. Anyway, so as you see that on the actual um, uh, birthday of Rome, April 21st of each year, the sun, the sun, the beams of sun that comes down through the hole. Of course, in Rome, the sun is always south. It's that because it depends on the position where we are on, on the earth. And the inclination of the sun, it makes the, 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 the sun rise going lower or higher, depending on the time of the year. So in the summer solstice, when the, when the sun is at its zenith, at the highest point it reaches over the year, it's, it's close to the mid of the sun. It doesn't never, it never get, gets right perpendicular because that only happens at the equator. Uh, on April 21st, which is the anniversary of the foundation of Rome, according to the tradition, it, the sun enlights perfectly the door, creating this effect, which is known as the where is it? The arch of of the arch of light. There it is, and um, um, and basically it, it enlights. It creates this perfect 
perfect system that basically it enlights perfectly the um, the door at noon. Now, to be able to build such a large building and be able to cast the light right on the center of the dome, you need a real precision in building something that's big. So for, for centuries, the, the, the historians, the archaeologists didn't believe that this was possible, was deliberate. It must have been a coincidence. But because this happening very accurately, I mean, it's hard to believe that, you know, it was just, uh, just um, you know, just a chance, just a coincidence. And then for on the equinox, it's higher on the top, so it only enlights the marble on the top of the door. And on the winter solstice, it's higher. So the Pantheon was also used as a tool to check the calendar and the possession of the equinox. Uh, the Roman calendars were losing few hours every year uh, until the calendar was reformed. Uh, it was first reformed by Julius Caesar, and then again was reformed later on in at the end of the 16th century by um, by uh, Pope Gregory XVI, and it was basically adopted by other countries during the years. I believe that the UK was one of the last countries in the world to adopt the Gregorian calendar, because of course the church, the England didn't depend on the Catholic Church by then, and sometimes in the 1700s. Someone has asked, Nada has asked, was this taken from the Egyptians? So the knowledge, the, the deepest knowledge um, of the astronomy and the uh, accordance of the astronomy with the buildings and the and all that it mostly derived from the Babylonians, and uh, and the calendar and a number of uh, the, the the use of the week, uh, which was it started to be used by the Romans as well in the first second century. The Romans didn't use the weeks until uh, only the later on in the, in the empire. Um, all came all this knowledge, uh, astrological knowledge, came mostly from the Babylonians. But in the ancient world. There was a large, uh, you know, there was a large connection with the astronomy by the Egyptians. What they took from the G Egyptians, it was yes, the cult of the sun. Uh, Amon Ra was the pharaoh, and so of course the emperors they wanted to be worshipped as the pharaohs. When and and this happens, the pantheon was built right a uh, few years after, only three four years after uh, Egypt became part of the Roman Empire, and there was a cultural influence, very big. Uh, cultural influence of uh, Egypt and the Egyptians into the Romans, of course. Um, imagine uh, ancient Rome as a, as a huge melting pot where people, uh, different cultural influence did enter the, uh, the Roman culture. And we have a number of, these are pictures uh, that show digital reproduction, how another version of how the Pantheon could have been. You see the marbles at the bottom, they're pretty much the same. They were stripped off and replaced in the, in the Renaissance, but uh, they are still basically there. And then they taught that the, the dome inside was actually gilded and would have been statues. And of course the beautiful rays of light inside. So in the Renaissance, the Pantheon saw a lot of changes because it became, and we might also use another um another another video this also was was taken during the during the lockdown uh with the panther because it was started to be used as a tomb as i said when it was originally turned into a church they buried some 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 um, mar marchers under the altar and then later on it was started to be used as uh, as uh, this says the silence of Rome is during April 2020 another drone imaging and so the several chapels and altar were turning to different tombs and and uh, starting from the 15th century um, the uh, a congregation uh, around 1540s was created that was a place to bury a congregation uh, for artists only. Now you might know that Romans didn't, there weren't cemeteries in, in Rome until the 19th century. The uh, people were buried into the churches. That's why Rome has so many churches and why there's so many chapels and so many arts into the churches because every family had their chapels inside the church uh, rather than in a cemetery. And um, the first cemetery of Rome was the Verano built in 1830. There was a non-Catholic cemetery built much earlier and there was also, uh, we can stop this one now. And there was also, um, um, sorry, um, uh, um, 
a Jewish cemetery and you know other 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 religion. But Catholics were buried into the church. So mo under most of these altars, there are basically uh, different tombs. This chapel here that we see is the chapel of Saint Joseph, and there was a priest, this man here, that basically brought back Desiderio di Segni, uh, the Terra Santa. He was. Uh, he went on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and the Holy Land in the 1540s and brought back like a, a little box of dirt, dirt from the Holy Land, so something to worship. And he wanted that to be buried underneath the altar that we saw, the altar of San Giuseppe. And in that altar, there is the congregation of the uh, Virtuosi del Panto. It's basically a society of artists that puts together artists that practice different arts. So painters, sculptures, um, um, architects, musicians, all together. So it's also the very first time that the artists are together because they do art and not because they do one type of art, which made them being closer to artisans and workers rather than to intellectuals. So there's a shift that happened in the late Renaissance where artists were recognized and intellectuals. This is the statue of St. Joseph and a teenager Jesus that it's on, on the top of the altar. And there are also uh, frescoes with the adorations on the side. And there are the tombs of several, several artists, including uh, the most famous one, which is actually has his own chapel because it's very interesting. In the, in the small one here, in this, in this place here, there are actually uh, Peruzzi, uh, Perin del Vaga, Flaminio Vacca. They are mostly uh, Renaissance artists, but also artists like um, Corelli, which was a musician, uh, and 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 few others uh, artists of different means. In this shrine here, there is the uh, tomb of Raphael. Raffaello Sanzio died in 1520 aged only um, uh, 37 years. When he was at the best of his career, he was working in the Vatican for the Pope's making the rooms of Raphael. And then he was, he was at that time, he was also the architect of the Basilica of St. Peter. He was in charge of building St. Peter uh, back then. He was also the inspector of the antiquities, a sort of a, a man responsible for all the ancient stuff in Rome, Roman temples, statues, Everything was under his responsibility. So it was really, really important. And imagine the amazing things it could have done if, if he lived just a little bit longer. And this tomb was used by Dan Brown before I played the music because I like uh, Angels and Demons. Um, when the book became a bestseller in the early 2000s, I was working that there were hundreds of people coming to look for the Illuminati and, and I never heard of them. So I was working right there at the entrance. People arrived and said, oh, I have a question. Oh, yes, please. What you? And I... I thought, you know, they want to know about Hadrian, about the architecture, about the church, about Raphael. They ask, oh, where's the Illuminati? Where is the, I say, Illumi what? I never heard about that. And then later on, I actually did the tour, which was very successful uh, about following the path of Illuminati. If you haven't read the book or watched the movie, I won't spoil anything, so don't worry. But I have a little scene from the movie where they are looking for a, a kidnapped cardinal. And there is this uh, Langdon, which is a, a, an American professor of, uh, of art, who goes and looks for it. So we just I just play the moment where they enter the Pantheon because they think that the cardinal is kept in this in Santi's tomb, which is Raphael's surname. So the tomb of Raphael, which of course has been buried there. There are a couple of mistakes in the movie and actually in the book as well. Mistakes, they're just like, uh, you know, poetic licenses in order to make the story work. And it works very well. It's very gripping uh, thriller. Uh, you have to make some changes and make things up. So because of course, Dan Brown is well aware of all the history and knows all the correct things. Let's be married. Well, maybe we're not getting along today. Hmm? Hold my hand. So they pretend, pretend they're a couple. Don't so crush it. Sorry. They, I was newly wed. they look for a kidnapper, so they just go in incognito. This is the doorway. That could be the demon's hole in the bone. Why are the tombs at an angle? I'll explain this later. They're to worship the rising sun. But this is a Christian church. New religions often adopt the existing customs and holidays to make conversion less of a shock. Like the 25th of December, it's the pagan celebration of the unconquered sun and also makes a handy date for the birth of Christ. Let's check the recesses. I'll go to the right, I'll meet you at 180 degrees. Follow me, please. Now, the Pantheon, which means temple of all gods, 
was originally built as a temple to all the gods of ancient Rome in 27 BC. Although the design of the building is usually credited to Apollodorus of Damascus, Robert! Robert! It's Raphael's tomb, but it's the wrong one. What are you talking about? It was moved here in 1759, a century after the Agarama was published. So I just interrupt like for a second. It this is is not correct. Uh, Raphael was buried there since the day he died, and we know that the tomb was opened in the 19th century. They made a, a basically a a, a, um, a a cast also of his of his right hand. So there's a number of of elements that uh, that we know. But of course, in the story, they have to um, prove it wrong. And then uh, I'll let it play more, and then I explain all the the, the details that that uh, the movie has brought up. Where was he originally buried? Uh, uh, you know, I think, Santi's earthly tomb. What could it possibly be Santi's earthly tomb? Damn it! Santi's tomb. It must mean a chapel that he built. He's not buried in it, he designed it. The demon's hole, it's not, the, it's not an oculus. It's an undercroft, it's a crypt. Are there any questions? Yes, yes. So this is the moment he crashes a guy the tour. And this always made me laugh because this is true. When you take groups and you do your own private tour or, you know, even if it's an open tour, and then there's always someone that's casually, you say, oh, there's any question that just casually crashes the tour and say, yes, I would like to ask a question. So it's always very awkward because most times people are paying. And of course, someone just crashes is a bit rude. And and the, and the, many times I say, look, I don't mind if you if you hear from a distance, of course, uh, but this People, you know, they they are on a paid tour, so so maybe maybe a bit rude to just crash into the tour. So 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 it's really really awkward. But let, let's did Raphael Santi ever design a chapel with an ossuary annex and an angel figure commissioned by the Catholic Church? I'm sorry, I I can only think of one. One is good. So one is good. They they of course went off to find the other tomb. The 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 pantheon that we saw in the movie it's a digital 100% digital reconstruction because the church did not allow the uh, the the crew of angels and demons to uh, basically use the locations in the churches, including the Vatican and Peter's, because the church was kind of against the idea of spreading, you know, playing with theology with the church. They didn't like that back then. So there was actually an official condemnation. Today, the church is very different with Pope Francis. It would not be a problem, I'm pretty sure. Someone has asked, um, and you can also make questions, ask questions in the chat, and then there'll be question time soon, um, if this will be recorded. Yes, and it will be... Um, it will be uh, available again uh, in, the, in the coming days. I'll send you also the link. So in case you have other commitments, you have to go. Uh, you know, you can you can follow it the second time. Okay, let's speak more about what we just said. So um, the the tomb of Raphael, of which we have the bust here. Um, so as I said, was was basically um, there in the uh, in the in the. Uh, 16th century, the statue, the Madonna of the Stone, because she has a, a, a foot on a stone, uh, was made by an artist called Lorenzetto, who was uh, one of the favorite uh, sculpture to work in Raphael's projects. Uh, in the movie Angel and Demons, after the Pantheon, they go to another chapel, which is actually the only chapel that Raphael designed in Rome, which is the Chigi Chapel in Santa Maria del Popolo, and they found what they were looking for, the cardinal and all that. And the uh, statues there, they are four, and two are by Lorenzetto, and the other two are by Bernini. So, because they didn't finish the project then, so Bernini worked in there about 100 years later. Uh, but the Madonna del Sasso was like an homage that Lorenzetto made. It's a very sweet Madonna. Uh, it's always not very... Um, I, I think people should appreciate it more, because it's a beautiful uh, Renaissance, early Renaissance Madonna, with all this, this beautiful, uh, you know, all the dressing, all the... Um, the 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 little anchement of the of the Virgin Mary. It's it's very very beautiful. Anyway, back to the tombs and the chapel. There is an association, a kind of group, a congregation, which is called the um, Virtuosi del Pantheon. I have here the um, 
uh, there's in symbol and the entrance, which are still active today. And uh, through this door, there's a staircase that goes up on the inside the walls and then all the way up to the dome. It was possible until maybe the 70s to actually go up on the dome to take pictures. Of course, for research reasons, this is a picture from up on the dome. The dome was in Roman times gilded, covered in gilded bronze. The bronze was stripped off in 352 AD under Emperor Constance II for cash, for money. And the pantheon was probably closed then. And then it was replaced with lead sheets in the in um, in the uh, there's a question about the floor. I'll, I'll answer that later. Uh, in sheets of lead, these are the sheets of lead that have been restored and replaced several times. Um, if I can, yes. So these are a group that of the Academy American Academy of Rome that were allowed to go up in the dome in the 70s. I myself have been on the dome a few times, uh, but uh, starting after 9-11, there was a uh, more uh, a higher level of security. And then of course, because health and safety, there's no, of course, parapet, there's no, um, nothing stopping you from falling down uh, 40 meters, about 120 feet and just smash on the floor. So basically it's not allowed. This is the, the entire classroom with the professor going there and Enjoying Rome, I believe this was early 70s. And you could see also the 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 dome up here is not as thick. The walls are not as not as 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 as, as thick, they're just over a meter. And then this is the view on a, a room very different from today. It's a room that was uh, you know, the most of the buildings will look, look orange and dirt, and now of course most of the buildings have been replaced. The Pantheon suffer a number of damages also with the floods, like in this case here. Uh, this is before they built the tall walls along the the, the river and were able to to basically protect the 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 pantheon from the periodical floods. Now um, about again the tombs and this is the detail of the tomb of Raphael, which is buried in a marble a Roman marble coffin, and that these two doves, the doves and the other the wrath of made of bronze was added later on in the in the, actually 1983, 500 years anniversary since Raphael was born. Um, let's go inside through that door. If we go through the door and the door I showed you before, this one here in the left niche, and we go upstairs, we enter this small museum, which is by the Accademia dei Virtuosi del Panto. They have a website. So it, it, this animation is, is available for free on the website Accademia dei Virtuosi.it. Maybe I'll, pa I'll, I'll put that in the chat. So if you want to have a have also a look at it later on. You will be able to see it. And, uh, and we can go right inside of, we are here on the first floor inside the facade. These steps are the ones that you access through that door I just showed you. And there's another door inside. We are halfway up through the dome. And there are a number of busts, objects, um, basically, uh, the, the plaster bust and the statue are by several artists. Most of them are by uh, Giuseppe de Fabris, which was a 19th century sculpture in Rome, or Pietro Galli, and then a number of portraits. Now, the virtuosi still do exist nowadays, and they do have to give a proof of their art when they are uh, become part of this membership. It, this is a membership, a bit like the noble. So there are some nominations and then they choose, they're choose. chosen because of their professional uh, achievements. So it's not something you can buy your way in. Most of these artworks date back to the 19th and 20th century, as you can see, mostly religious art, because of course it's a religious congregation like this, Cain and Abel. Uh, I assume you know the story. And then another, you know, religious artworks, mostly 19th century, as I said. But there are some really amazing uh, objects, as I will uh, show you. And um, first of all, you could see there are a number of, of rooms and projects and plants because there were architects, there were painters, there were sculptures, and a number of different objects. And then here we are able to see the structure of the pantheon made in bricks. And some of these bricks were analyzed in the 19th century. And that's when they realized that most of the bricks date back to the time of Hadrian, even some that would have been in, in structural parts of the building. And that's how they were able to find that the fact that the pantheon was probably um, 
built, rebuilt by Hadrian. So we know Augustus built one, but probably is what was rebuilt at the time of Hadrian. The portraits of these gentlemen, these ones at the bottom are popes, mostly of the 16th, 17th century. This is Desiderio, the founder of the congregation, the picture I showed you before. You could see uh, Pope Alexander VIII, Pope Paul III in the, in the 16th century. These are all popes after the foundation of the congregations that basically uh, was recognized by the, by the church. So it's the Pontifical Academy. Starting from the 17th century, they even started to have a yearly exhibitional artworks in the porch of the Pantheon, in the, in the pronoun, in the, in the part in, in the, inside the Pantheon on the, on the, on the front, um, which was something like kind of unusual to have an art exhibition right in the street, in the square. And these are some of the members, some of them, they wear, let me see this one here, they wear the, their uniform. They are kind of, are kind of actually dress up during the day with the, with the, with their uniform, with their color. Most of this might not be familiar for most of, uh, of you of us, because even you know, if you study history of art, some of them are not that famous, but this one is, this is um, uh, uh, Giuseppe Valadier, who was the artist who designed Piazza del Popolo. In fact, I don't know if you could see the design here, with the square with the three streets coming from it is actually Piazza del Popolo. He's the one who designed and built Piazza del Popolo bit uh, around 1810, 1815. So I, at the beginning of the of a, of a 19th century. And he was a member of the of the of the of the society. And then down here we have uh, one of the greatest uh, muses that inspires, of course, the 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 Academia, the Pontificial Academy, which is, of course, Raphael. That's Raphael's past. This is not by Raphael. This is a 19th century uh, artifact, so much later. But it, of course, celebrates the great master. We can actually go into this room as well. And so we we walk basically. Imagine the facade of the of the Pantheon. We basically walked through halfway through the pronos, the, basically the the walls inside between the entranceway and the hall inside at the back. It's a, a very unique place and it's a, so good to have this virtual reproduction because actually this is not accessible. The museum is actually private. I mean the walls are owned by the government as well as the Pantheon although it's a working church so they still have services, they have choirs, there are concerts, they have a service every Sunday, every Saturday on the main holidays uh, although it's closed now but the objects, they belong to the church. So they, all these objects that you see, they all belong to the, to the church. The main offices are on Via della Conciliazione, right by the Vatican, right by St. Peter's Square. They have their main office there. And I used to know the director, um, the president of the congregation uh, years ago. Now there's a new one, I, I, I don't know there. Uh, in the past, it was the Dr. Tiberia was actually uh, also uh, uh, he was a um, member of the uh, superintendency. So basically the office that manages and takes care of this amazing, amazing uh, monument. So this was, is a little in, insider, insider, insider view as well. Now, the church, the Pantheon is used as a church for different and different um, uh, occasions and someone before asked a question about the floor is the floor a map of the roman empire is not technically a map but this the checked um theme of the floor the the basically my, maybe my see it here uh, the black and white the the circle and the square they are an allegory of the uh union of the sky and the earth the round symbolizes the the the, the sky and the earth sim is symbolized by the square it's the uh, celestial principle and the earthy principle the the day and night the yin and the yang you know can make a number of comparisons the niches there are seven because they correspond to the seven main planets that the roman knew and also the entire pantheon with the vault it's an allegory of the universe and universe in greek is called cosmos, which also means order. In fact, 
or decoration, cosmetics, you know, comes from that root uh, word cosmos. When I explain these things about Greek language, it's, it's, it's always like, I, I sound a lot like the, my big fat Greek uh, marriage, the, the character that always pretends that every word comes from Greece. Not every word, but many words come, even for the Romans. The Romans were highly and deeply influenced by the, by the Greek culture. So there is a huge influence of the, of the, uh, of the Greeks in, um, in, in the Roman culture. Anyway, cosmos, because the pantheon is a small a microcosmos, like a small symbol of the universe. And who is the guarantor of the harmony and the equilibrium of the universe, of course, and the life and prosperity in the universe? Of course, the sun. So on earth, who guarantees peace and prosperity? Of course, the emperor. So it is a religious building, but it is also a political machine to support the propaganda of the emperor, of course, Emperor Augustus. Most of Roman architecture can be read as a tool of propaganda, which was used as well as a propaganda by the church. And there is this very interesting ceremony that takes place for the Pentecost, which is usually in June, and is the uh, Catholic celebration uh, of the descent of the Holy Ghost on the disciples and Virgin Mary right after the resurrection of Christ uh, about 40 days later. And uh, that's why it's uh, usually in June, it's 40 days after the, 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 the Easter. And, um, and that's what allowed the disciples to speak every language, travel the world and spread the gospel. Now, every day of Pente every, um, on the Pentecost, on every occasion, in the Middle Ages and in the Renaissance, they had some rose petals being thrown down to the keyhole and a statue of uh, Virgin Mary in, the, in, in certain, in certain uh, times to be making ascending out from the keyhole. Uh, that other, the, the, the Virgin Mary ascending to the keyhole was made during the Assumption, uh, or Assumption of Mary, uh, 15 of August, while the petals are made on the Pentecost. This short over the Tiber River, the faithful gathered also in the basilica of the, the voice, uh, shows how the fire brigades still do now. They, they didn't, I don't think they did it this year. Uh, uh, yeah, 50 days. So, sorry, uh, 50, yeah, 50 days after the, the Pentecost, 50 days after this. How they throw these petals down to the keel. Now, this tradition was stopped uh, for many years, uh, probably a hundred years or so. And in the nineties, there was a, a father from a, a little city in Southern Italy, Gifoni Vallepiana, and he may convince his uh, fellow citizens to donate the pedals and to start the ceremony again. So uh, his name is uh, Monsignor uh, Tedesco. He was the archpriest of the church of the Pantheon for several, several years. It's not anymore, but it was for many, many years. And I was lucky enough to have the pleasure to, you know, uh, know him quite well. And um, and um, these are the five brigades, which, of course, you, you can't just get got on top of the Pantheon. And... Um, and he is explaining how they actually climb on the roof with these bags of rose petals, as I say, that they come from this uh, uh, town in southern Italy, Gifoni. Gifoni also has a film festival. Um, it's quite a famous film festival. And uh, it's a southern, about an hour drive south of the Amalfi Coast. It's very, very beautiful. And they made the rose petals. And that day, the Pantheon is jam-packed. It's really, really crazy. And of course, uh, you know, that was the day where, you know, it was one of the busiest day that we had at the Pantheon. And they still do it nowadays. Um, hopefully, after the pandemic, you'll be able uh, to to see, oh, there's someone, uh, Fabiana from Gifoni, ah, fantastic. So they're going up those stairs. I show you before the rooms are halfway to the stairs. They go up on the top of the dome uh, and it's quite steep. And of course it's, it's not for the faint hearted because you know, it's very, very, and then they're all ready. And of course with the radio, they're given the command to throw down the, uh, the, the 300 kilos, 400 kilos pedal. I don't know how much it is, but it's really, in the order like oh, they have a small truck like loading that and then and then they bring and of course he's explaining of course the, the, all these videos all these materials are all uh, available for free on youtube so uh, it's uh, it's um something you can watch over and over and then uh, where is it the it's uh, this is nearly over of course it's a preparation of it inside of the pantheon um let me just get over so it's really, really a special occasion. And so of course, the red symbolizes this, the Holy Ghost descending on the crowds. It's very, very beautiful with crowds looking, taking pictures and seeing this miracle of light. So the Pantheon was also used for the 
propaganda of unification of Italy. We have the last uh, maybe five, 10 minutes now, and then we'll pass on to question time. I just went a little bit over time because you know I, I get carried away when I talk about the Brampton and, and uh, the Roman history, so many, many memories of it. Um, in fact, inside there are the tombs of the kings of Italy. Uh, we are, yes, uh, they are, so the main altar was refurbished in 1700s by an architect called Paolo Posi and with a mosaic and then the statues were added and replaced several times. There's also a, um, a monument of the Cardinal Consalvi by Berter Tolvalsen, which is a very important uh, 19th century artist, uh, same time of, of Canova. And then in the two large chapels on the side, so this is the door here, and then there's one chap, main chapel here on the right and another one main here on the left and then the altar and of course the minor ones on the side. On the one on the right as you enter there is the tomb of Vittorio Emanuele, Padre della Patria, the father of the, um, of the country and to him it's dedicated the, the building you might be familiar with, the Vittoriano, the big white building in the center of Rome, also known as the wedding cake because of its uh, big white shape. You know, it looks like a, like a giant white typing machine. And on the left side, the tomb of his son, Umberto. Now, let me pull up some uh, pictures of, the, of them. Um, so, oh yeah. And you might know that Italy only was unified in... Uh, 1870, 1861, the declaration of the Kingdom of Italy, unification of Italy, where all different parts of Italy came together. And in 1870, the uh, Bersaglieri entered the walls of the city of Rome and Rome became the capital city of Italy again. Uh, the, that winter, the, the king came from Northern Italy down to Rome. At that time, the capital was Florence. From, from for about five years, the capital of Italy was Florence, before it was Torino in the north. And after he died in 1878, the king was buried in the Pantheon. This is because the Vittoriano wasn't even planned. Uh, it was after he died that the Italian government decided to celebrate with a large altar, a kind of a memorial for all the soldiers who gave their lives for the unification of Italy um, in the center of Rome, which took some 30 years to be built. So it was only finished in 1911, and it became in 1920 also the tomb of the unknown soldier, similar to uh, the tomb of the unknown soldiers that it's like the Cenotaph in London or Arlington Memorial in the, in the United States in Washington. Um, the, uh, the king, of course, was king of Italy briefly, but opposite there is the tomb of his son, Umberto I. King Umberto wasn't very lucky because he was shot and killed by an anarchist in, uh, um, I think it was March the 9th, 1900, in Milan, in Monza, actually, near, in uh, it's a town in the outskirts of Milan. And um, uh, the anarchist was actually a Roman emigrant uh, whose name was uh, Gaetano Bresci. I got support here that instead of uh, helping me, is sending me <laughs> messages about the monarchy and the... So, you know, uh, Italy was a monarchy from... Uh, the unification of Italy, 1861, till uh, 1946, when then the Italians voted out um, the king, because, of course, the monarchy led us to the war and the fascists and all that, so Italy is now a republic. This man with this uh, fantastic moustaches is the king in a high uniform, and um, Umberto... Uh, he lived a very difficult time because there was a huge socialist movement, anarchist movement. It was the dawn of the Industrial Revolution in Italy, which happened much later than in the Northern Europe. So basically, there was a lot of discontent. There were strikes. And in, uh, in, in a few years earlier, um, he ordered to, um, he appointed a general called Baba Beccaris to basically control a demonstration in Milan. People were striking because they charge a tax on bread. So this affected everyone. It was really um, in, a, in, a, in a time where most Italians were very poor. Italy was quite a poor country uh, before, uh, you know, the, the, the economic boom in 1950s, 1960s. So um, 
uh, at that time most people live on agriculture and or, or basic basic basic, basic uh, works so what happened is that Baba Bakari shot on the people killing over 200 demonstrators including women and children it was really horrific and years later the king appointed a sort of medal of honor to General Baba Bakari it was too much for some people uh, Gerardo Bresci was an Italian emigrant working actually in New York City, in the suburbs around New York City, and he was part of a group of uh, um, radicalized emigrants. He was an anarchist and a socialist, uh, you know, as, as you know, often uh, happened in at the beginning of the 19th, uh, at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century. Um, and so he came back to Italy. He took like a ferry, came back. Uh, and he decided that it was too much. He had to kill the king and to avenge those people and 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 re, re um, reconnect with the with basically uh, the honor of that. So what happened? He, let me just get if I can get the picture. This is the man. This is Gaetano Bresci. There have been two more attempts of killing the king. One in Naples and the other one I don't remember. So it wasn't the first time and. If you are, I don't know which part of the world you're connecting from, but you know, in the 19th century, it was quite common that people actually, you know, tried to get and, and shoot a king or an emperor. World War One was start was started because Franz Ferdinand was shot in 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 um, in uh, Belgrade, or also uh, think four three American presidents were shot before Kennedy, then four with Kennedy. So it was you know quite quite a quite a common thing. I mean shot and killed, not just shot because that's a lot more. And in the 19th century mentality or early 20th century mentality, to killing a, a king, it was a much greater uh, crime than being a terrorist and killing 100 people because the kings were there because God wanted that. So it was really considered a great crime. Anyway, Gratano Bresci uh, was arrested. Uh, I have, yes, there is a picture of the... So this is not very good, but this is the king being shot. Uh, and then this is from a magazine, an illustration from a magazine that the day after. This is the other king. This is another man. And let me just get. Yes, this is the king just coming out of his residency with the with the with the with the queen Margherita, and uh, they ended up basically, um, you know, he, he he was shot and and died, and then his, his son uh, Ah Sarajevo, uh, and this and the son. Um, um, king Victor Man the third became king and he was the king during fascism and doing all the bad things that happened to Italy in that time. Um, let's go back to the tomb because then Gerano Bresci actually died in prison. He was sent to Sicily with a, with a life uh, sentence, I think, or a death sentence, but he the death sentence was never carried out. He just died. He was found dead in his prison as often happen in that location. Um, underneath the, the tomb of Umberto, which is buried here, there is the tomb of Margherita, which might remind you of the Pizza Margherita. Now, the Pizza Margherita was already quite popular in Naples since probably the 1700s, but there was this genius of marketing, uh, Brandi, who has a pizza place. The pizza place is still existing in central Naples. And when the king and the queen visited it, of course, before the assassination, I think it was 1897, and he made a pizza with the colors of Italian flag, the red tomato base, the mozzarella white, and then the green basil, colors of the Italian flag. And dedicated it to the queen margarita and so that's why the margarita queen was born the if you ask the margarita um margarita drink that's a complete uh um that's a complete um uh, different story so it's not that is not related with the with the um basically with the with the um with the queen now the last thing this two couple more things i want to tell you let's see if uh, if i have a picture here and then google might be helping me a little bit uh the in the 1600s john lorenzo bernini was asked to um create he first was asked to create some uh, bell towers that were put on the top of the facade that were later demolished in the 19th century because of course they were not ancient this is, by the way, yes, I have here. This is the tomb of the, of the Queen Margherita, you see, with the coat of arms of the Savoy kings here, the, the red field and with the white cross. And, uh, and then the ceiling of the Pantheon 
in the pronouns, so basically in the entrance hole here, this one here, we are underneath the pronoun here. This is basically, let me turn it around for maybe it might be better. And um, this were entirely, yeah, that's better. This is entirely covered with bronze. Now it's all wood, but originally it was all covered with bronze. This bronze, tons and tons of bronze was stripped off in 1630s by Gian Lorenzo Bernini by order of Pope Bonifacius VIII of the Barberini family. You might be familiar with the coat of arms of the Barberini. This is Pope Barberini because he has as a coat of arms the three bees of the Barberini that you find almost everywhere in Rome because he wanted to make sure that everything or anything that was built under his uh, papacy bear his coat of arms, a sort of a marketing campaign. Uh, so the altar in St. Peter's Basilica has his bees everywhere, many fountains in Rome and so on. The Bronze was actually stripped off, but was not used for the altar of St. Peter, was actually instead used to make cannons for the castle, some 70 cannons. So it was a lot of bronze. Because Bernini, when he won, then went to make the cast, which was not made by him, but he had people casting him, uh, casting it for it. it. They weren't sure, and he wasn't sure that their bronze, so ancient, was the right type of material. They didn't know how it would have behaved by melting and rebuilding. While the cannons, if they didn't work, they could just be re remade. And that's when the Romans started to say, what the barbarians didn't do, the, the Barberini did. Quod non fecerunt barbari, fecerunt barberini. And so it's still now, to nowadays, a way of saying of everything that was destroyed or transformed or reused by the church, all the ancient Roman monuments and statues that were destroyed. To be honest, um, the church did manage to preserve a lot. The, the very invention of the very modern museum, which are the Musei Capitolini, were established in 1471 by Pope Sixtus IV. Same Pope who built the Sistine Chapel. So it's not completely true to refer to the church as something that destroyed. The church also helped to preserve by reusing and giving a new life to these ancient monuments as it happened for the Pantheon. Now, just a few more details. This is the inscription that as the bees on the facade, we are next to the door of the Pantheon, that it says uh, exactly that the Pope Urban VIII ordered to strip off the bronze and to reuse in the Alt Age Vaticanus. I can't read it very well, but it says here that was put in the Vatican, which is actually not. This is propaganda. This is the way to tell people we're doing this because it goes to decorate a most important church. The thing that was lucky that they spared was actually the door. This is a, a picture of the door. It's about a foot wide. And I say each one of them weighs 7.5 tons and it open and closed by hands every day and night. It doesn't have an inch but has like a giant sphere at the bottom and it rotates on that every now and then you put some little bit of exhausted oil of car car engine oil uh, in order to make it work a little bit smoother but basically uh, the, the 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 pantheon uh, door which i have i have also a picture here it's um, one of the three, only three sets of doors. You can see how tall it is when compared to a person. Uh, still preserved in in Rome and still since the Roman times. Now. Um, these are the bell towers that Bernini built in the uh, 17th century, in the 1600s. And you can see that the letters were missing there. There was also the, only the grooves, because the bronze was stripped off, stripped off as well. And then in the 19th century, just as a curiosity, the, the letters on the facade of the, of the, of the Pantheon were basically used to create the uh, Roman font in the 1400s. In fact, the, what we use today, the font has different names, but the Roman font that was a classic font uh, that was used in the, in the printing, in the books in the, in the 15th, 1600s. It was basically based on some, um, an alphabet written by um, Leon Battista Alberti, the famous architect and, 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 and uh, an artist um, who basically established in the early 1400s the canons of Renaissance based on Roman architecture. He studied the Pantheon, of course, uh, the, the timpano of the Pantheon, this, the, 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 
the, the, the facade of the Pantheon and managed to create a, a, a standard for a Roman writing based on the giant letter of the Pantheon because it was very, they were very big, very well preserved. And so they were a perfect way. I mean, the grooves were very pre well preserved and it was a way. You might notice in, the, in this painting that at the bottom there was a gate which was melted during the war where they needed a lot of metal. So uh, the, the, the gates were stripped off and, and melted. And since then there's no gate. So, day night the, the pantheon is 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 uh, and its surroundings are basically almost every uh, almost um open now as you may have noticed i don't believe in pre uh, powerpoint presentation i like to pull up the pictures as i need to make it you know to give you like, the actual experience as we have in a, in a real guided tour in a real talk and i hope you appreciate that the last thing i'm going to show you inside of the facade um we saw before the museum, there's also this chapel here in a different, there's a different staircase on the side. It, it, the access is from the right side, looking at the facade. And inside there is a chapel built by the Virtuosi del Pantheon as well. And this window on the right is one of the giant windows that you see from the inside. If you look up, there's, a, there's a giant windows inside the Pantheon. And then one of them is this one here, another place that is almost impossible to access. Now I have finished, I went a little bit over time. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, you can unmute yourself if you want just to say anything, ask a question, if you want to um, uh, possibly not sing a song. Somebody asked to sing a song last time. So if you want to just, you know, ask a question, make sure you have the, the you unmute yourself, you make the microphone, or you can now also ask a question on, on Facebook. Uh, just before we finish, I uh, remind you that I do every month one or two free talks for everyone. So invite please your friends, your family, and this will be available for free on uh, YouTube channel. I also uh, uh, run weekly uh, paid talks. They start at, um, they, they are, let me just get the website again. They are the, the com complete program is on a home page. I will send you, it's on a Facebook page or you say, I'll send a, a message, an email if you want. Why is not, sorry, never, technology never worked really has to. Anyway, on the front page of the, of the website, you can find the, all the upcoming tours. Most of them are repeated throughout the uh, year in uh, every two or three months. So next one would be Pompeii in uh, next Sunday. Uh, we'll speak about Pompeii also in the perspective of the inhabitants. And then there will be one about the rooms of Raphael in the Vatican. And again, Bernini, Borromini, Michelangelo. So basically, I'll try to cover most of the topics that are relevant. Um, I believe that this kind of tours are more like something in between traveling, but also kind of a way to look at history differently. Because when you travel, you always rush and you always, you know, run. And so this is it's like a for people who've been there, it'd be nice to know something more. And for people who haven't been there yet, it's, it's good to know where to go, what to do. And, you know, you've already done your homework. So when you get there, you know. Because even when it, I, I am a professional guide, so I do lead tours in, in many places in Rome, but also in Italy. And, uh, and you always rush. There's always so many things to do and to see and so little time. So I really love this uh, way of being able to show uh, share information. Let's see that. I see there's lots of questions. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Does the rain and wind come through the Oculus? If so, how do you imagine? That's a very, very good question. It does indeed come through. There is a legend that says, oh no, when it rains in the pantheon, it doesn't rain. It is not true. It does rain. And what happens because there's only two openings, the door and the hole on the top, there is a stream of air that comes in and then goes out from the roof. So there is a little bit of, of air going up. So the rain, it might not be coming down uh, with the same impact. It depends also how it rains. And then also because the light it's only coming, uh, depending on the time of the day, it comes with a different inclination. For if you are by the door or outside the pantheon, look, look inside and it's raining. Sometimes you do not see the rain. It does rain, but you do not see it. So that's why many people believe that it doesn't rain. There's a miracle that doesn't rain in the pantheon. Of course, it's not true. And, and the funny thing is like, I worked there for years. So I saw that first hand many, many times. <laughs> And every now and then there's someone that comes and try to convince me, no, it doesn't rain. I read it. I read it. <laughs> and, then, and then, of course, you have to convince that 
it it does but you know of course when it rains uh, it's uh, and they manage it because there is a drainage system with about 16 holes in the center of the floor and more around and so the the there's a sewage system that drains it all but uh, what what usually you do you you put like a fencing in the center so people don't walk in the center because there's no wind inside of the pantheon compared to outside once the rain enters the keyhole it just goes down straight so it doesn't really go much uh, on the side so it stays pretty much in the center so you can still visit the morning morning rains and it's believe me we normally don't like rain when we are on holiday but that is a blessing if you are in room and you and it's raining and it's pouring rain go straight to the pantheon because it's amazing to see the rain that enters a building. And it's something that the people couldn't get their head around. In fact, before, when in the movie, The Angel and Demons, they said they, they hold of the demon. In the Middle Ages, they come up with this, this idea because they, they couldn't get their head around why the Romans were so good, left a hole in the roof. I mean, who would want to build a building that big? It's about 2,000 square meters. It's huge. Uh, with no... I mean, with a hole in the roof, that's that's not good. That's not going to work. And so they thought that when the pantheon from a pagan temple was turned into um, a, a, a Christian church, they made a ceremony and the devils that were there, so the pagan gods, they didn't know how to escape. So they made a hole through the roof and escaped. And then the devil tried to get in again. So they made the excavations around. In fact, there's a gap. There's like uh, uh, 15, 20 feet between the, the street level and the walls of the pantheon around. You, you might look down on the sides. And... Um, and so that is the devil walking around in order to come to wait to come in again. And, uh, and that's why uh, Dan Brown, which is a genius in reusing the Roman history and, and, uh, and use all these details, you know, to make his story, the demon's hole, because the devil made the hole by, by escaping the tomb. Uh, I visited the building, fascinating that I, I, I certainly agree. And great tour, um, visited. Thank you very much. Please, as soon as the, especially if you if you don't live in Italy, as soon as the um, pandemic is over, hopefully by next spring or at the latest, I think next fall, because if the if the vaccination is out, I think we nearly see the end of this. Uh, we will uh, be able to see the the be, be able to travel again. Be please uh, do visit again Italy. Do travel to the Pantheon to Florence, and in the meanwhile. I would be glad if you can join our future talk. If you need any further assistance, you can email, you can phone. Um, that's another good question. Who maintains the building now? Now, the building was maintained in the past by the church. It became to the Camera Apostolica, which was basically the entity of the kingdom of the church when the church was actually ruling on central Italy before the unification of Italy. Uh, they were basically uh, administrating most of the public building, buildings. When the unification of Italy was made, the Camera Apostolica was incorporated by the Italian government. So the building is owned by the Italian government and maintained by the Italian government. But the church has a capitolo, a group of priests, that manages the church aspects of it. So they have access to the sacristy, in which at the back of the pantheon there are more rooms than another private museum it's it's owned by the state though but it's not open to the public there's all the old decoration of the chapels the ancient temples and the ancient shrines and decoration they are there is hasn't been restored in 100 years so it's not open to the public there's more fragments from of the old pantheon um and um and there's a sacristy with the icon of virgin mary which is the one that you could see on the main altar uh, that is believed to be one of the oldest images of Mary. It's only 6th, 7th century, but was believed to be, be painted by St. Luke while the Madonna was still alive. Uh, so the sacristy is where the church, they get ready and then they, 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 they actually um, make the services. So they do uh, are responsible for the uh, ceremonies and the church aspects, but the Italian government that manages. That's why, because it's both owned by the government but managed by the church, that's why there is no entrance ticket and it's free to enter. Uh, otherwise, there would have been a ticket uh, to enter because it's every other monument. And the Pantheon is also a model for many other buildings with the same name, which are usually tombs of famous people like the Pantheon in Paris. In Paris. And I remember years ago, there was a temporary exhibition about um, about uh, 
um, the uh, Saint Exupéry in the Pantheon in Paris, and it was on a, on a newspaper, and people flocked into the Pantheon in Rome <laughs> to, to look for the exhibition. We couldn't figure out. Okay, I worked um, TJ Bruno. I work on an archaeological project in Pompeii for ten season. Not this year, unfortunately. Be one of to see your presentation. Oh, thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Oh. I'm, I'm only, so I, um, I studied aesthetics, which is the philosophy of art in Rome, and then I started to work for the Sorintendenza, uh, which is the office that manages the antiquities in Italy, in, in the one in Rome managing the Pantheon and other buildings. And then I started to become, to do um, tour guiding as a freelance as well, uh, around uh, 2005. So since then I also be working. So my ex expertise in actually into learning and communicating making easy for people to understand roman history archaeology and, and art so um i'm not an archaeologist but i i know enough to be able to make a good presentation and be able to translate that buonasera grazie um yes the uh, thank you very much thank you very much uh, but I have a question about Raphael's death. I read somewhere that the body buried in Raphael's tomb in the Pantheon isn't really Raphael. This year, researcher made some new discovery about the body. So they, it's true, because it was the 500 years anniversary uh, since Raphael died, there, there was a big exhibition in Rome uh, at the School of Quirinale, exhibition that was then closed three days after the inauguration and was closed most of the year. Um, and for that occasion, they opened, they inspected the tomb. The tomb has been inspected before. First time it was open, I think it was 1883 or around then. And they checked that the remains were there. Now this time they did some tests and the research. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if the results are out. What they were saying as an early result is that they are not sure what killed Raphael. Raphael uh, died very young, in, uh, age 37. And we know from the description of his life that um, Vasari, Giorgio Vasari made, that he, he was a womanizer. He loved women a lot. And he must have really be a lot into party because um, Vasari wrote hundreds of lives of artists and he doesn't mention any personal detail for any of them except for Raphael. And he makes really clear that he did party a lot to a, the level that eventually killed him because he was feeling weak one day and then he didn't tell the doctor that he's been partying all night. And so eventually they made... Um, how do you say with the leeches when you take the blood out? How do you call that procedure? And which was the only thing they did back then. You know, they basically they told you you have to rest. They give you a bit of chicken stock, and and then if they thought that you you had too much bad blood, then they suck it out. Of course, he had must have had some sort of anemia, and that anemia, you know, with the leeches, then uh, basically killed him, and that's the reason why he died. Probably they think it could have been a victim of a sort of syphilis, which at that time started to spread a lot. It arrived in, in Europe, in, uh, in, in Naples, probably with trades with the Near East. Naples was one of the main harbors uh, trading with the, with, the, with the Near East uh, at that time, in the Renaissance. And that's uh, the first, uh, um, speaking about pandemics, the first uh, was, uh, uh, pandemic with syphilis, uh, the first cases were in Naples and they spread all over. Uh, but the funny thing is that in the France, they call it the Italian disease for that reason. In Italy, we call it the French disease because it's sexual related. I don't know why, it's just very, very interesting. And, uh, and, and the, the, um, so syphilis will leave a mark on the bones, uh, we will leave some specific evidence of that. So I think they're looking to the bones and the remains to test if there are signs of what actually killed Raphael, which I don't think makes much difference because, you know, uh, it could have been civilized. But there's also a long uh, problem. This also affects Pompeii because there's also the different forms uh, of civilized. There's also a congenit one. And, and the congenital one, the one you're born with. And that one, they believe only came as well, uh, you know, later on as a consequence of people having it and giving birth to child children with that. But they think they found some evidence in some remains in Pompeii. So maybe it arrived also during the Roman Empire. So I've 
my some of my colleagues they do talks about pandemics and black deaths and plagues in the past and historically i'm not too keen on doing something like that this time because maybe people want to learn something different and not think about deadly diseases and and thing um but uh, thank you again for that that question um so so exactly how he died we don't yet know but probably there will be some more information in a few months or years uh but we Vasari said that he was weak, he didn't feel well, and then they sucked his blood and then he died. But in a matter of a few days, it, by the time he got sick and he died, it was only, I think, three days to a week, something like that. The, the, the very interesting thing about Raphael, he was born 6th of April, uh, Easter, uh, uh, Easter Friday, um, uh, 1483, and died the same day, 6th of April, which again was the, uh, the Holy Week, uh, the Friday before, before Easter Sunday, um, in, in 1520, as if it was like God sent. He died on a special, he, he was born on a special day and he died on, on the same day, which is, you know, the odds of being born and, and die in the same day, are uh, very few. And last week, a very famous Italian actor actually died on the day of his birthday, turning 80, so... Okay, any more questions? Uh, I hope you enjoyed the talk. Um, I'll be sending you um, a, a thank you email soon and also a recap for the future, uh, fu uh, yeah, bloodletting. Um, and I hope to see you again. The next free tour will be the Secrets of the Sistine Chapel on uh, December 19th. So we get a bit Christmassy. If you're busy, uh, busy with the thousand errands before Christmas, uh, you might also be, if you sign up, you receive also the, the recording if you can make it on the live uh, session. Thank you very much. I don't know if anyone wants to ask anything else or I think we're good to go. Ah, William Shakespeare. You see, I didn't know that one about William Shakespeare he died and was born on the same day. You see, it must have been something with the extraordinary gifted artist. Okay. Good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Buona notte. Buona notte. Thank you very much. Oh, look at that kit. Who's got that fat kitty? Isabella. That's a beautiful cat. Congratulations. Oh. Okay. Is a microphone working? Yes, it does. Oh, I'd like to know so much um, if the structure of the Pantheon has the golden number or the... Um, the... the yeah, yeah. So the gold, uh, the the the, the uh, sezione aura, the gold section, the tympano, so the triangular part on the top, it is based on that, uh, not the not the the drum, which is the walls at the bottom, and the and of course the the sphere, because the spherical shapes and and circles they are based on pi, so uh, not on the gold section. But the 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 tympano, the proportion that definitely they are based on that, as you know. Classical architecture use vastly those proportions. Grazie molto. Thank you, Raja. Complimenti per il suo italiano. Okay, if anyone wants to ask uh, something else, other, the microphones uh, can be, um, can, they do work if you want to open. Okay, thank you, Toronto. Okay, everybody, thank you very much. Good night. There will be the recording available soon. Thank you very much. Take care. Have a, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Bye bye. Ciao. Grazie a tutti. Ciao. Ciao, ciao, grazie. Good night, bye. Good night, good night.